1603, Shakespeare wrote a play called Othello. And in it, he had this line. Good name and man and woman, dear my Lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse, steals trash. Tis something, tis nothing, tis mine, tis his, and has been slave to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. What's worse than losing your good name? See, the East Germans understood this, and they used that to devastating effect. As the 1960s gave way to the 1970s, they began to realize that they wanted to have a better reputation with neighboring countries. And all the assassinations, the imprisonments, all the human rights violations, they weren't helping matters. And so they came up with a new way to control their populace. They called it Zerzetsung. It means literally to decay or degrade. And it's actually a pretty accurate word for what they did. You see, instead of assassinating someone and taking their life, they would assassinate their character and take their good name. And they knew the truth worked best. They had a whole surveillance network designed to try to find the skeletons in everybody's closet. They wanted to know everybody's vice. And so they would tap countless phones. They had thousands upon thousands of personal letters they would read every day. They had a whole network of informants that would give them all the dirt on everybody they were tracking. So they could expose their skeletons. So they could trap them in their vices. And they could ruin their reputation with the people in their lives. But you know what? If they couldn't find the truth, they'd just lie. They'd send anonymous letters with doctored photos, phone calls, and telegrams designed to make your spouse think you were having an affair. They'd interfere at work, and they'd bury you beneath a pile of work so you didn't have time to think about anything else. Sometimes they'd give people special privileges like a new car or money or position to make the people in their life think that they were the informant. They would do whatever they could to try to disrupt your life because they knew that if your life was in shambles, you'd have a hard time being a problem to them. You see, if you go around assassinating people, that the families don't like it and the press can run with it. But if you assassinate their character first, they realized, well, you can do anything you want to them and no one cares. And it worked like a charm for a while. In 2014, there was a guy named Hubertus Knabe who gave a TED Talk where he talked about his experience with the East German secret police called the Stasi. He talked about one conversation he had with an official that was pretty high up in the Stasi. And he told that man that if that guy had sent an informant to him, he would have known who it was. Do you know what that official said back? He said he wouldn't send anyone. You would just look, use someone close to you. Later on, he found out it was his two best friends. By the time the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, the Stasi had 90,000 employees. Their informant network made up more than 1% of the population. People lived in constant fear that their good name would be absolutely destroyed. I mean, in classic German faction, they actually wrote the book on it. A 50-page manual on how to conduct Zerzetzung. There it is. But they didn't invent it. You see, they got their tactics from the KGB, who got their tactics from the Cheka, their predecessors of the KGB in Russia. And if you follow it down, you get all the way to Othello in the 1600s, written by Shakespeare. And if you keep going, you can go back 3,000 years to a summer palace in a place called Jezreel with a pouting king and a conniving queen who can carry out Zerzetsung in a way that would make the East Germans proud. We read from 1 Kings 21. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, a Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. 
Ahab said to Naboth, Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it's close to my palace. In exchange, I'll give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I'll pay you whatever it's worth. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. So Ahab went home sullen and angry, because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay in his bed sulking and refused to eat. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard. Or if you prefer, I'll give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel's wife said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed his seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring charges that he has cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city did as Jezebel directed. In the letters she had written to them, they proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him and brought charges against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed both God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. Lies destroy. That's all they can do. You can't build on them because they're not real, but boy, can they rip apart. I mean, it started innocently enough. Ahab is sitting in his summer palace in Jezreel, a place that the Bible says is inlaid with ivory. It's got every possible amenity save one. It doesn't have a convenient vegetable garden. But then he looks and he sees that a guy named Naboth has his vineyard that's close by and it's fertile. It'd be perfect. And so he makes what seems like a fair offer. I'll give you one better. I'll pay you whatever you think it's worth. But Ahab should have known better. You see, the land of Israel was not the Israelites to buy and sell. That land had not just been given to Naboth. It had been given to his ancestors and it would be given to his descendants. Naboth knew if he sold that vineyard, he was selling his place in the land of the promise, and he wouldn't do that. Ahab should have understood. Ahab should have respected that. But instead he goes home and he throws himself on the bed like a royal eight-year-old, throwing a fit. And his wife Jezebel comes in and she's just as much of a spoiled brat, but maybe she's a little smarter. And she comes up with a plan that would leave a man dead, his vineyard taken, his name destroyed, and a whole town culpable. How do you get that way? You see, lies, they don't just destroy other people. The more we spin our lies, the more it hurts our hearts and our minds. I mean, how long had Ahab and Jezebel been lying to themselves? telling themselves a lie of their own sovereignty, convincing themselves they had a right to be happy no matter what the cost, telling themselves that their position as king and queen meant everyone else had to get in line and do whatever they wanted to do. How long do you have to tell that lie to yourself before you end up like this, willing to destroy someone's life for a vegetable garden? I mean, just think of all the destruction that comes from that one letter. She writes that letter and it goes to to the nobles of the city who know Naboth and they know that none of this is true. But they don't want any letters written about them. They hire those two men to lie who also know it's a lie. But maybe they figure Naboth is dead anyways. He might as well make a buck. The people of the town show up. There's a fast that's proclaimed. It's a symbol of repentance. They know something big happened. Their Naboth is, he's accused, and they do what they think the law requires. They put him to death, and in the end, his blood ends up on their hands. 
But who lost more than Naboth? He didn't just lose his vineyard. He didn't just lose his life. He spent his last moments on this earth looking the people he knew and loved the best and the most, thinking the worst possible thing they could think about him. That he had forsaken God and God's people. And for what? So a spoiled brat could have a convenient vegetable garden? I mean, it's so ridiculous that if it was the plot of a movie, you wouldn't believe it. You'd think there'd have to be something else. But is it that ridiculous? See, when we read this account, I think it's easy for us to, to see the fingerprints of the Stasi all over our current political climate. We can imagine the Ahabs and the Jezebels pulling the string. You see different ads running on TV, and maybe that's happening, maybe it's not, I don't know. But I think there's a closer danger we should be worried about. Because oftentimes nobody can carry out Zerzutsung. Nobody can play the part of the Jezebel like we can. You see, we know the truth works best. And if someone has the misfortune of truth falling into our hands, we've got one of two options. We can either A, keep it to ourselves, because maybe we realize if the whole world knew the full truth about me, what would they think? Or we can go with option two. Tell our friends and our family members, our neighbors, the people in this person's life, the people in our life. Spread that to everyone we know. And maybe we feign concern because it makes us feel good about ourselves. And maybe act like we're offended because it itches that self-righteous scratch our sinful nature has. Or maybe we just like the way that the truth in the hands of a liar can absolutely destroy. But whatever the case, that person's reputation ends up in tatters. And if we don't have the truth, we'll lie. I mean, we are real good at telling a story where we emphasize what this guy did and kind of leave out what I did. Where we see this guy did this and that guy did that and find a way to make sure we tell the story in such a way that we look like the victim and that guy looks awful when the truth maybe isn't quite that clear cut. And other times, we'll just out and out make something up. We'll just straight lie if anyone gets in our way. And for what? What? So someone will think maybe a little more of me and a little less of them. So I can feel good about myself as I feign concern or pretend to be offended. So I can just see the way the truth in the hands of a liar can rip someone apart or just because someone got in my way and the lie of my own sovereignty. Think of all the ways we have just destroyed people's reputations. Isn't that funny? We read this story and we think we're Naboth. But oftentimes, how often aren't we the Jezebel? And that lie doesn't just destroy others. A couple of verses later, Elijah goes to find Ahab. And do you know how Ahab greets him? This is what he says in verse 20. So you have found me my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. This is the king of God's people, and when God's prophet comes to find him, how does he greet him? As his enemy. You see, those lies, they don't just twist and hurt the lives of others, they twist our hearts and minds and turn us against God himself. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. I was 13 years old when that happened. Do you remember watching that on TV? It was quite the day. Protesters tearing down that wall. Game changer for the people of East Germany. But on that day, the, the Stasi, the German secret police, they were busy. You see, they had a problem on their hands. They had warehouses of files, of taped phone conversations, of personal letters, of information given by informants on all kinds of people. And they had to try to get rid of it. And so they got to work and they destroyed what they could, but there was so much and there weren't enough of them. 
and it fell into the hands of the outside world, and today we know exactly what they did. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if God kept a physical record of every phone call, of every text message, of every sarcastic comment I've ever made? He could fill warehouses. And yet I suppose physical records are for people who can't remember. God has a perfect memory. And he doesn't just know the things I say, but he knows how I felt when I said it. He knows why I say what I say better than I do. Nobody has more dirt on us than God. But Ahab was wrong. Wrong about just about everything, but especially about this. God is not your enemy. He wasn't even Ahab's enemy. If you read through the story, God has some pretty harsh words of judgment to speak to Ahab, but Ahab repents in sackcloth and ashes, and God actually pushes off his judgment until Ahab jumps back in the same old thing again. And he's not your enemy. He has all the dirt on us, and yet he takes that weight of our guilt, all the ways we've torn people's names apart, and he puts it on the shoulders of the only one who could carry it, the one who bore our sins in his body, it says in 1 Peter 2, so that God couldn't hide it in a closet, couldn't pretend like it didn't happen, but so that he could deal with it as it had to be dealt with so he could make it right. And it killed Jesus. It cost him his life, but it got you a brand new name. You see, in our lives, we're called all kinds of things. Some of it good, some of it not so good. But in the waters of your baptism, God put his name on you, the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that name means something. It means you live underneath the umbrella of God's promises. It means that when God looks at you, he doesn't see a gossip or a slanderer or a liar. He sees his perfect child. A name that you can really build on. In that TED Talk in 2014, Hubertus Knabe was talking about why he thinks the whole thing fell apart. I mean, if they had such control over East Germany, why did it all fall apart so quickly? And what he said was, is because every part of the Stasi was meant to make sure no one person knew too much. That way, if someone defected, they couldn't kind of expose what they were doing. And so the whole system was made to make sure no one knew the truth. And if no one knows the truth, no one can see the problems. And if no one can see the problems, no one can fix them. Isn't it ironic? In the end, the lie destroyed even itself. And that's all lies can do. We can take them and we can twist them and we can change them. We can make them say anything we want, but we can't make them real. In the end, all they can do is destroy how completely different that is from the truth. Do you remember what Winston Churchill said about the truth? He said, facts are stubborn things. They do not care how you feel. They do not care about your opinion. They just are. And the truth is, you are a child of God. It's the name you got in your baptism. Nothing can take it away. The truth is, because of Jesus' life and death in your place, you are innocent, holy in his sight. The truth is that because you bear that name, you live beneath the umbrella of his promises. See, that's a name you can build on. Basis for a relationship with our God and with each other. It's a name worth protecting. Amen.